Hello, Dino here, and welcome to the Dino Saw for week six of 2023. Another seven curious, interesting things I saw last week. So as ever, let's crack on. Um, first, if you do like these, give them a like and uh, give them a share, all that sort of good stuff. First of all is Glass.ai, so this is for medical practitioners to get better at diagnoses. So if you type in the symptoms or how they are presenting to you, then it will give you some suggestions of what might be the, uh, the outcomes or something that you should probably be talking about to your patient. So I, I have typed in a completely fictitious 34-year-old man, which is essentially me a couple of years ago uh, with a hurty kneecap, and I stumbled and uh, I had a hurty knee. Um, the second thing on here says, well, Basically, because you said you stumbled on uneven grounds, uh, most likely diagnosis is probably patellar subluxation, which is exactly what I had. Uh, I also had bursitis as well, which is the fifth one on there. So, so that's really interesting. So if you want to have a go at this, then obviously uh, hit the URL. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, first of all, it's a really good use of the likes of GPT-3 because the data set is relatively logical, the input is relatively logical, and therefore there's, there's a really good uh, relationship between the input and output. Um, now, now, the other thing was, is if you go to Google, you and I probably know that if you type anything into Google as a symptom, the third thing down will probably say you've got cancer and you should go to A&E. So this is really useful because it, it you can see why Google are probably panicking right now because this is just much, much, much better way of uh, getting some results. Um, if you do want to have a play with it, by the way, go on private um, a viewing mode or private browsing because the cookie doesn't get dropped and you can use it over and over again. I didn't tell you that, obviously. Um, this is kind of sad, but also kind of interesting, uh, which is why it's in here. So this is light reactive polymers. So researchers have found uh, this new polymer that if you shine a laser on it, then it will move. The ultimate goal of this is to use it in nano robotics, so you can get stuff to move about, or at least you can navigate things using this um, by shining light on it. Probably not so great for medical applications because you can't get the light inside the body, but in, in the real world, and in this case, they're looking at things like farming. So modern agriculture has killed all the, the bugs, killed all the bees, or is killing them, uh, and therefore you might need a pollinator in the future. Um, clearly this is not going to be great for birds who eat these things, but um, scientists probably haven't thought that far yet. But that said, uh, the plan is to have these as maybe like dandelion things float, fluttering about, but you can steer them in certain directions, or even as you say, um, or as they've said, they're like bees or little um, fluttering bugs. So uh, that's kind of interesting, see where that goes. Hopefully we never need these things, um, or at least for pollinating. Um, this is kind of embarrassing. The teething problems, we're seeing more and more of these things starting to come out of these generative um, algorithms. So this is uh, stable diffusion. Uh, and what um, some people have found out is if you do a certain type of research on this, you can find that certain images are actually one-to-one -one, uh, represented within this, this system. Now I'll explain what that really means in that when you train these algorithms, you train it on images, absolutely hundreds and thousands and millions of images. If it sees lots of images of Mrs. Doubtfire, for instance, it doesn't really, it doesn't store anything about Mrs. Doubtfire. It just knows that this is tagged as Mrs. Doubtfire and an image seems to be, has a lot of white around the corners and it has this sort of lots of pink stuff in the middle, whatever. It doesn't actually store the actual image itself. Actually, that's not exactly true. So what researchers have found is in the main set here, 0.03% of them are actually what's called overfitted. They've trained so much on these images and they have no other images to train on that when you say Mrs. Doubtfire, it's trained pretty much exclusively on this image. So when you ask it for Mrs. Doubtfire, it spits out all that it knows, which is pretty much the same image. Now, why is this interesting? Well, if you're an artist or you've got in any way copyrighted material, the big sell so far is that, don't worry, we're not actually using any copyrighted material, it's never stored. Well, clearly, in certain circumstances, the machine that does this can actually replicate it and essentially have your image in memory. So the result of this, or at least the, um, the cure for this, is if you are programming these systems, just make sure that any image that uh, you are overfitting to is removed and you should be good to go. But um, at the moment, nobody knows how many images are stuck in the system that may be copyrighted. So um, more of these things are coming out each week. Uh, this is not a fantastic piece of news, um, but there you go, at least we know about it. Um, this is a great piece of data work, and this is using FIFA 2022 World Cup data, 
uh, and then joining it to lots of other data sets like transfers and club news or, or club uh, statistics and which players work with who. So um, what this did, uh, did is it's right like is there another way that we can use all of this data to create these really inter interrelational data points and what they started to find out was some really interesting stuff. Um, three things probably worth mentioning is one is they could actually predict the outcome of the World Cup using the data alone uh, to 60% accuracy. Now that's not a huge amount over 50-50 I guess but if you're a bookie that's really, really interesting uh, data. Uh, the second thing they were looking at is um, the amount of interest that they, or data and assumptions they can make on the number of players plus transfers. And there's a sweet spot in um, how many players have a certain amount of transfers and therefore there's a, 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 you can see on the heat map, is where they become most valuable. So depending on what thing you're looking at, um, there's, if you look at the amount of transfers they've had, then there is a value proposition there each one. So um, if you look at where they become most valuable, it's kind of just below 15 transfers in their career. Um, now on that, they then said there are two types of club. There are spenders and mentors. Spenders just buy players and mentors take younger players and mentor them into good players. So there's lots of really interesting conclusions coming out of this data. If you're in the sports space, it's well worth a read about there how they did it. Um, this is very exciting news um, about energy generation, or at least green energy generation. This uses dirty seawater, or just let's just say, un, uh, not um, um, not specifically um, prepared seawater, shall we say? So it's not particularly dirty water. Um, but what it does is just uses normal seawater, and they've got this new um, electrolysis, new uh, catalyst within it that can then take the seawater, put some electricity through it from ideally solar and therefore it is free and it is green uh, and it then generates oxygen and hydrogen which can then be used for fuel. So this obviously um, seawater is almost infinitely abundant on the planet. Uh, if you turn it into um, uh, oxygen and hydrogen and you combust either of those then you will get water that comes out of that combustion as well so it pretty much goes back into water. So this is really interesting and really exciting. Um, now hydrogen is an interesting gas for uh, green energy because it might be the intermediate step between things like electric uh, aeroplanes which are going to be heavy with batteries um, but at the moment if you can use hydrogen to power the, um, the turbines, then uh, you get essentially zero emissions as they're flying uh, rather than uh, burning hydrocarbons. So that is quite interesting news. Um, this is a really funky um, generative world maker, shall we say. Now, if you're a game maker or you're talking about the uh, air quotes metaverse, uh, then this is an interesting way of doing it. So you type, uh, as you're seeing probably on the left-hand side, you just type in your thing that you want, um, whether it here be rolling hills and uh, your clusters of surrounding trees, but actually you want the trees in winter, but actually you don't want it in winter, you want it in, in autumn and all that sort of stuff. It can generate it in 3D and you can explore those worlds. So as you can see here, describing essentially a story. So if you get a book that describes, like you used to get with the old graphical adventures, you know, you are standing in a forest to the left, you can see a, a woods and in the distance you can hear the babbling brook, that sort of thing. It can actually now generate those and you can go and play those as well. So, um, so that is opus.ai. Uh, well worth a look. Um, not exactly sure how robust this will be in professional use, but if you're a storyteller, then uh, you almost need no technical knowledge to start creating these really interesting worlds. Might also be useful if you work in the film industry to um, start sort of scamping up or that you know do all those sorts of things. Very interesting. And finally, uh, just an, an extra little thing. I've um, been noticing quite a lot of really funky posts where people have discovered that if you just put emojis into things like Midjourney AI, which will generate images from text then you can get some really, really interesting results from it as well. So, you know, the more emojis you use, then the more complicated it will be, of course, just like normal text. Um, but this is really, really interesting because each emoji comes with an inbuilt sort of set of what the, what, what it kind of means. It's quite a dense um, a language, should we say. So uh, it's interesting how it's unpacking those into certain things. So um, it's probably been trained on uh, images uh, with emojis attached to them as well. So um, that's really, really interesting. I just like where this is going. So have a look for that if you can find those. There's some uh, really interesting article about not only emojis, it really goes into emojis, but it then says, you know, this is the latest version of what we're doing with them. So um, very interesting. Hopefully that was interesting. I uh, hope it was useful. If it was, give it a like, try and send it to somebody, and I will see you next week.